I'm Tom. My life was changed. I'm Eric. A life that was changed. I'm Jesse. A life that was changed. I'm Joyce. A life that was changed. <laughs> Amen. My name's Teresa. A life that was changed. My name's Jerry. A life that was changed. My name's Damon. My life's been changed. My name is Nancy, and five and a half years ago, my life was definitely changed. My name is Gary, and my life has changed. My name's Terry, and my life has been changed. My name's Raymond, and my life has been changed. Praise God. We want to thank you for watching our services online. Since 2004, FCF Tucson has been repairing broken lives and training willing people training them to reach others with the message of faith in God here and around the world. Right now, we've outgrown our rented facilities, and our desire is not to build a cathedral, but that we could purchase a headquarters where we can expand and continue to train workers to change lives. We found our facility. That's where you come in. You can help us touch lives. Consider investing in the new headquarters facilities for the harvest at Faith Christian Fellowship of Tucson. We believe God is going to give us a thousand partners who will give $300 to get our new headquarters open. You can be one of them. However, your gift in any amount will be a tremendous blessing for the lives of people like the ones that you just met. If you or someone you know has been impacted by FCF Tucson, it's time to invest in those lives. You can give online at www.fcftucson.org backslash contact or send us a check to the FCFT Building Fund at Post Office Box 89156, Tucson, Arizona, 85752. Obviously, all gifts are tax deductible. I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And ask you to consider prayerfully helping us get our headquarters open. Well, if you've got a Bible with you, Good for you. Amen. Let's look in uh, Luke chapter 15. I was going to go on to 16, but I just couldn't get this out of my cross, so we'll go back and visit 15 again. We took maybe a little different tack on Luke 15 the last time we looked at it, maybe than you've thought about before. But to, to me, that whole chapter is about how much God loves people. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to teach with all those stories. He uh, was talking to the multitudes that... Uh, he actually went to the, the tax collector's house, and the, the scribes and the Pharisees didn't like him eating with the tax collectors. Remember that? And he started talking to them about uh, you know, his explanation of why he hung out with Pharisees and sinners. And remember, he talked about having the hundred sheep, and if one of them wanders off, he'd go out and, and chase that sheep down and, and bring him back, and there'll be great rejoicing. And if you lost a coin, remember that? A coin rolled up under the dresser, you know, and you have to get down on your hands and knees and bend the coat hanger and, and get a flashlight and uh, try to find that baby. He said, you just keep, you keep, how long do you keep doing it until you find it? And she found her coin, and everybody got happy. And then, uh, then comes the story. We, we usually call it the story of the prodigal son. Uh, but the, the, the message she was teaching there wasn't about the son. All of it, we don't really need a lot of instruction about how to be prodigal, do we? Amen. Most of us have got that one down. Amen. What he was trying to teach him was the father's attitude when the prodigal came home. That was, that was the point he was trying to make. And so he spends the, the whole chapter talking about really three different aspects or different kinds of people who are away from home or out of pocket. Y'all know what out of pocket means? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know uh, where you're from, but in Oklahoma, everybody knows what that means. That's a standard expression. It means you ain't where you're supposed to be. And uh, I was in New York, and my secretary, I, I used that phrase one day, and she uh, had no idea what I was talking about. I so I called her and said, uh, if anybody calls, I'm going to be out of pocket for a while. She had no clue. She said, but if they call, I'll tell them. 
don't know what that means, but I'll tell them if that's what you want me to tell them. So she was Italian from New York City. You got to have <laughs> mercy on her. But <clears throat> so we find people here that are out of pocket, and we talked a little bit about uh, dealing with people who are out of pocket, people, people who are uh, part of the family should be in the house, but have for whatever reason wandered away. And there were three different kinds of folks here. They were, they were all away for different reasons. The sheep, you know, wandered off just because he's stupid. I mean, just ignorant, don't know much. Amen. A lot of people are like that, aren't they? They just wander off. It's not really, they're, they're not malicious. They're not really offended. They're just dumb. They don't even know what they need and where they need to be. And then the coin, of course, was lost because somebody was stupid enough to lose it. The coin was lost because of somebody else's um, either just carelessness or maliciousness, whatever. Uh, some, somebody had to lose that coin. It didn't just wander off. And then uh, the third guy, the prodigal, uh, he was just willfully disobedient. <laughs> you know, I want what I want when I want it, and I'm going to go do what I want to do with it when I get it. That's right. And uh, he did what happens to most of us when we do what we want to do when we want to do it. He wound up in the pig slop till he had his moment of clarity. So we talked about that when God uh, sees people who are out of pocket for whatever reason, his goal with them is always restoration and reconciliation. Absolutely always. And that's important for us to get. Uh, certainly that, that process, that desire on the part of God begins uh, long before people wind up in the pig slop. Amen. At least on this side of the cross, we don't have any record of what was going on in that uh, prodigal boy's heart until he was out in the pig slop when he started practicing his speech, you know. Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Amen. <laughs> He practiced it all the way home. <laughs> Amen. And uh, uh, so we don't know what was going on in his heart other than he wanted to go out and, and to do his own deal. But uh, on this side of the cross, uh, we know that, that God begins dealing with folks about stuff. If they're, if they're born again, if they have the nature of God in them, if they have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, that God's such a loving Father that uh, anytime, before somebody walks off and wanders away, certainly as a prodigal and oftentimes as a lost coin or even a stupid sheep, uh, there's something on the inside of them that's telling them don't do that and probably has been from the moment they started thinking about it. Amen. Well, sometimes we forget that, you know, when we're dealing with people because we're so carnally minded. And I, I believe people are the hardest thing to use your faith on. I do. Why? Because they're just weird. And, and we're, we're, we're carnal, so we tend to go by what we see. And then oftentimes we're gullible enough to believe what they say. It looks like a fellow would wise up after a while and realize with most people, if their mouth is moving, don't pay attention. And a lot of times they even believe what they're saying. That doesn't mean it's true. It just means that's what they're saying. Amen. The thing we know is true, that if they know the Lord, that the Holy Ghost is dealing with them. Amen. Now, when we have people in church, you know, that are kind of uh, stumbling along in the wrong direction, uh, he tells us in several different places, some things about helping them. Galatians chapter 6, let's go there. We looked at this last week, but I want to take a little more leisurely time here. Because uh, people always ask you questions. Once you become a, just, as soon as you become pastor so and so, everybody thinks you're a genius. You know, or you got a straight line to God, you know. And I haven't got a straight line to much of anything. Amen. I do have the Holy Ghost, and He does tell me stuff about people sometimes. Amen. Amen. And most of the, I have people come and ask me about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Well, even if I knew, it'd be none of your business, would it? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. But uh, when we're dealing with people, people ask you a question like, why does that happen? What, you know, the, the classic question, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, the same reason they happen to bad people. It's that Adam deal again. Amen. We live in a, in a lost and broken world that's run by the devil. 
So if you don't duck real good, you're going to get hit. <laughs> if you, I mean, if you're around long enough and awake, somebody's going to run you over. <laughs> Amen. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Look in Matthew chapter 5 if you don't believe it. Anyway, Galatians chapter 6, the first verse. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, I'm reading the New Living Translation. If another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, the, the King James says, you who are spiritual, that's actually a better translation because the, the uh, word is pneumatikoi. As a matter of fact, what it says in the Greek language is you, the spiritual, hoi pneumatikoi, you, the spiritual ones, you spiritual folks, should restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Amen. He said, in this translation, he said, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. Well, that's a revelation a lot of people need to get hold of, isn't it? You are not that important. And if you will ever get a hold of that, it will help you immensely. Most people think everybody else is thinking about them all the time. And that means that they run around all the time worrying about what people are thinking about. The truth is, most people are simply not thinking about you at all. They're busy thinking about themselves. Hey, man, people say stuff and do stuff. You know, now, I know, I know I'm the only one that does this. Do you think it's because of something you did and you've offended them? or you've, uh, yeah. Come on. And then you find out later it's because the, the dog pooped on the carpet or something. It had absolutely nothing to do with you. <laughs> Amen. Why? Because we just assume we're the center of everybody else's universe just like we are of ours. <laughs> but it ain't necessarily so. Amen. Amen. You're not that important. That's a good verse right there. We ought to just preach on that. Amen. So uh, he tells us here, when somebody else is stumbling, our goal as believers, as spiritual people, hoi pneumatikoi, the spiritual ones, our job is to restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Interestingly enough, and some of you know this, I'm sure, because I've said it five or six times, so you got it, didn't you? Amen. That's about once a year. Yeah, not even that. Once every two years. The word restore there is the verb form of the Greek word poemen. Anybody know what that word is? What it's translated? It's in Ephesians chapter 4, the 11th verse. It's translated pastor. <laughs> Do you know that? You who are spiritual, pastor such a one in the spirit of meekness. The word pastor uh, one of the things that, that, that can be translated is restore. It's a, a word they used in this context, the way it's used here. Uh, it would be used for, for somebody who'd broken a bone. It would say, uh, why don't you just set it like you would set a broken bone? So how do you restore? How do you set a broken bone? Well, you, you uh, uh, put the ends and back together, back in the right position, right? Amen. <laughs> If it's displaced, if the bones are not in their right relationship to each other, if it's broken and displaced, you have to put it back together so that it'll grow back in the right position, right? So when you get it back in its rightful position, then what do you do? You support it in that position until healing comes. That'll preach. If somebody's overtaken in a fall, you spiritual ones, you put them back in their position and you support them until they're healed. Glory to God. That'll preach, won't it? Amen. He said, but take heed to yourself. Amen. He said, do it in a spirit of meekness. Anybody ever had people that corrected you and told you the truth? But there was just something about the way they said it made you want to just knock them upside of the head. Amen. I think Paul understood that here, don't you? I want you to restore him. He didn't, he didn't say just ignore it. We don't ignore people when they fall into a situation like that. 
uh, leave them flopping on the ground wounded, you know. But when we restore them, we need to do it in the right spirit, the spirit of humility, spirit of meekness. What does that mean? A, we're not trying to hurt them, but B, we're recognizing our own fallibility. We're down off the judgment seat. God sits on the judgment seat, not us. Amen. So uh, you can you can act you you can restore people in the wrong spirit. You know why people do that, don't you? Because it makes them feel better. If I can help you and feel superior about it at the same time, then I've done two things. I've helped you and I've made myself feel better. <laughs> Until, of course, he said, unless you also be tempted. You see, there's, there's the catch in that whole thing. Because what? Pride goes before a... Aww. Yeah, come on. The moment you start thinking, that, boy, that could never happen. I just don't understand how anybody could do something like that. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Remember the prodigal? He said he profligate living. We don't know what that meant. It never anywhere in there says what he did, except he just spent a lot of money on stuff he shouldn't have been doing. But his big brother, he, he knew that boy had been running around with bad women. How did he know that? Well, either he's been out there in the pig style following him, or else he was just assuming his little brother did what he would do if he had the opportunity. Come on, that's what most of us do, isn't it? Yep. We just assume other people are doing the same things we would do if we could get away with it. <laughs> I remember back in the 80s, which is kind of frightening when you think about it, but <laughs> a friend of mine was a pastor in, uh, in Oklahoma, Norman, and uh, it was right in the middle of the great TV evangelist debacle Anybody old enough to remember Jimmy Swaggart and, and uh, what's his name? The, 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 yeah, Baker and Tammy Faye. And I, I remember we, when we got to New York, we, we started this little old church, you know. And I got a letter from another pastor in the area welcoming me to town. He said, you just came here to steal money off these people and to take money out of their pockets, take advantage of them. You're just like Jim and Tammy Faye. I told you, you need to buy you some new eyelashes, sweetie. Because you're way behind here in the eyelash department. Didn't have enough makeup in the whole house to make her look like Tammy <laughs> And I, I got news for you, Jim Baker, about this tall. So we didn't really look like Jim and Tammy. I dress better than Jim. But the, uh, <laughs> not as gaudy, but better. The... Uh, but I, I, when the, uh, people, a whole bunch of people got upset about that, you know. Well, Jim was whining and dining other women, and I mean, it was horrible, some of the stuff that happened. He went to jail for stealing people's money. But the, uh, all I could think about when people would come and say, how could that happen? I said, that's a good question. How could somebody as intelligent as you seem to be get your money taken by a charlatan like that? You did what? You sent him $1,000 to so you could ride on the Ferris wheel? You're, you're riding the roller coaster for Jesus. Think that all the way through for a minute. People dying and going to hell around the world, and you think God wants you to send $1,000 so you have a lifetime membership in the Ferris wheel club. Come on. I mean, there's dumb and then there's dumber. I didn't have a bit of sympathy for it. They appeal to the lust of your flesh, and you just said, sure. And now you want me to condemn them. No, you're the idiot. Anyway, where was I? Oh, the great debacle. No, that, that, it was on Nightline. Remember Nightline? I, I made that guy's TV show, by the way. Uh, it was nobody knew anything about it until they started having Jim and Tammy and all the people commenting on Jim and Tammy on there every night. Everybody's staying up listening to all the dirt on the evangelists on national television. Dear Lord. But then that was when Jimmy, anybody remember Jimmy? He's still on the TV. Jimmy got up, he got on his TV show and started talking about how horrible them people were and, you know, lightning going to strike them. I don't know what he, but yeah, you know, I mean, he was just every show talking about how awful they were and and uh, God going to get them, and blah, 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 blah. I'm <laughs> Old John says, 
You know what? One of these days they're going to find out that Jimmy's got his own problem along those lines. You know, when a man starts giving all that energy to condemning somebody else's sin, that's because he wants to do it really bad. About a week later, <laughs> come on, busted by the police. Come on now. I won't even tell you what he was doing. It's just too disgusting to talk about in public. But, but I thought he made Jimmy look like, or made uh, Jim and Tammy look good compared to what he was doing. Amen. But I thought it was pretty perceptive on, on Pastor John's part. He saw it coming. He said, why is he so mad at that man for sinning? He ought to be heartbroken. ought to be crying, bawling, and squalling, trying to restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. He said he's on national television cussing him. What's that about? That's about him wanting to do that and get away with it. And he's probably doing it behind the scenes himself. Bingo. I'll never forget that. I learned something. Amen. If, it, if somebody else's sin makes you really mad, go home and get your mirror out. Amen. See if you can find that freckle on your face. How did I get on that? Anybody remember? Oh, yeah. Also notice this. Uh, other people's failings are not your fault. Amen. So don't get sucked into that. But they should at the very least give us a moment's pause to think, boy, but for the grace of God, there go I. Every time I read about some preacher that's fallen into some egregious sin somewhere, I, I think, dear God, keep me on track. Please, don't let me get off. Amen. Amen. So, we learn something in those verses. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let's look there. We looked there last time, but let's look at it again. In the 14th verse, he says, We exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. So he talks about three or four different kinds of folks here. He talks about warning the unruly. Remember we talked about the word atoktos, uh, which means uh, somebody who's not well ordered. He said to warn them, nuthateo, admonish them, give, tell them the truth about what they're doing. You know, after a while, when people first come into the body of Christ, they're supposed to be unruly. You know, it takes a while. Anybody ever had a two-year-old? <laughs> it takes a while to break them, you know. And contrary to popular opinion, that's what you're supposed to do. Otherwise, nobody will ever be able to ride that horse. They'll shoot him for dog food. <laughs> you've got you to break them, amen, one way or the other, and get their will into submission. Amen. So, but it's normal when, when people come in, they're spiritual babies, you know, uh, that they're unruly, but there they're reaches a place where they're no longer being, they shouldn't anyway, be kids. They ought to be growing up a little bit. At that point in time, he says, when people don't set themselves in order, when they don't submit themselves uh, to authority and to the church and to bring themselves into a position of getting in step with the rest of people to accomplish the plan of God, that people in the congregation, not talking to the preachers here, talking to the church, he said, you warn them, admonish them, nuthateo, put some truth in their mind. That they're unruly, they're out of step. I used that illustration last week, remember? There's always that kid that's got two left feet. Left, 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 left. Now, you got to teach them how to use that other foot in time with everybody else or they're always going to just be a little off. Amen. Uh, but it's our obligation. He's talking about in the local church, among the brethren, when you see somebody who just seems to be all the time pushing at the at the... Uh, restraints and pushing their way, like a teenager, you know. Testing everything. Always want to do it their own way. You got to warn that person. Get back over here and get in line. Get in step. What's the matter with you? We have a responsibility to each other to warn one another. He said to comfort the feeble-minded. 
the uh, New Living, the New King James tried to dance around that, called it faint-hearted or fearful. That's not what it says. It says feeble-minded. <laughs> but that doesn't sound good because we, we're not supposed to say those kind of things about people. And some people are just feeble-minded. You actually use the word oligosukos. It means people with a puny soul. So that could either be emotionally or mentally. Uh, at least for the moment, we don't have to stay feeble-minded. But, but uh, sometimes you've got to take people that don't have enough sense to come in out of the rain. You've got to at least buy them an umbrella. Amen. And remind them what to do with it. <laughs> so when people don't seem capable of, of uh, functioning for themselves, he said, what are we supposed to do? Comfort. It means come alongside and put your arm around their shoulder and talk to them. Now, honey, it's raining and we need to go in the house. <laughs> come on. And when you've been around for a while, if you've been in any church anywhere or any organization anywhere or any family anywhere for any length of time, at the end of a couple of weeks, you can tell who this scripture applies to. Come on. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're supposed to do what? Come alongside those people and give them a little encouragement. Not knock them in the head, not trip them, not throw them out the door, but put your arm around their shoulder and love on them a little bit and encourage them to do the right thing. Help them. I said help them. Amen. He said uphold the weak. The word means come up next to somebody and let them lean on you. Hold them upright. If they're getting too weak to walk by, isn't that what you do when somebody's having a hard time walking? I remember the day my back blew out in here. I couldn't stand up. Lord, I was passing out. Seeing them little stars in front of my eyes, you know. Got my guitar on. Amen. <laughs> and uh, I had some fellows had to help me to the car, so I go to the emergency room. Amen. I'm not, I don't do help very well, but I was sure glad to get some that day. <laughs> Amen. When somebody's, uh, for whatever reason, doesn't say why they're weak here, just says they're weak. If they're weak, hold them up. Amen. Uh, and be patient with everybody. So this is his desire for the way we treat each other within the body all the time. If somebody's out of step, admonish them, warn them. If somebody's, you know, uh, feeble-minded or faint-hearted or whatever you want to do with that verse, uh, do what? Comfort them, encourage them, strengthen them, help them to keep walking. If somebody's so weak they just can't go any further, well, hold them up for heaven's sake. Amen. Be patient with everybody. So that's the will of God among ourselves. But how many of you know sometimes the unruly just stay unruly? And when you try to admonish them, they get unrulier. Amen. That's when we get over into the next level here of why things happen. Hallelujah. Because he told us in several places in the New Testament, in several places, in the Second Thessalonians 3, he said, stay away from all believers who live unru unruly or disorderly lives. He started talking about people ought to work. And then he said, uh, take note of those, verse 14, who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. <laughs> Stay away from them, so they will be ashamed. Don't think of them as enemies, though, but warn them as you would a brother or a sister. Talking about the disorderly. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes when people are disorderly, it's because they got the wrong attitude. It's not just because they're dumb, not just because they're babies, not just because they haven't grown up yet, but it's because they got a chip on their shoulder, and the problem with having a chip on your shoulder is there's always somebody that wants to remove it for you. In this case, it would be God. And when God starts knocking the chips off your shoulder, you're going to have some interesting days. Now, restoration and reconciliation are always the goal. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, he quoted from the Old Testament. He said, you must remove the evil person from among you. I mentioned a little bit about that last time. But I thought I probably ought to visit that a little more. He said that what kinds of things in the New Testament did Paul say we ought to go to the extent as a church where we actually have to address it in that kind of a strong fashion? Romans 16, the 17th verse 
I'm reading once again from the New Living Translation. He said, Now I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters. Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They're serving their own personal interests by smooth talk and glowing words. They deceive innocent people. And then again in Titus 3, in the ninth verse, he says, Don't get involved in foolish discussions about spiritual pedigrees or in quarrels and fights about obedience to Jewish laws. These things are useless and a waste of time. If people are causing divisions among you, well, that sounds familiar, didn't he just say that in the previous section to the Romans? Sounds like it might have been a trend, do you think? He said, if they're causing divisions among you, give a first and a second warning. Everybody say a first and second warning. So he didn't say just kick them out and get mad and hit them with a two by four. He said, do something, go talk to them first. After that, have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. The, the, the Greek actually says they are self-condemned. They've condemned themselves. Well, that kind of sounds like the, the old boy out in the pigsty, don't it? He just did that on his own. <laughs> and what, well, why did God let him be in the pigsty? God had absolutely nothing to do with it. God tried to stop him. In this case... Uh, that Paul's talking about here, God's probably been dealing with these individuals on a personal level for months, maybe even years, until Paul says, finally, you're going to have to talk to them, warn them twice, and then cut them loose. Why? Because they're causing divisions among you. Why is that dangerous? He said, because they're deceiving innocent people. God wants us to protect the innocent. Amen. When we read in Paul's writings, 1 Corinthians 5, we talked a little bit about this last time. But this old boy w was uh, apparently sleeping with his stepmother. And everybody in the church knew about it. And uh, some historians tell us that, that uh, the family was actually in some sort of a leadership or position of, of esteem in the congregation. And nobody wanted to deal with it. And when Paul wrote to me, he, he rebuked the church leaders first. He said, how come you're letting this go on? What's the matter with you? <laughs> You ought to be bawling and squalling and grieving about this happening. Well, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that if you've got people set up as, as being uh, established in the church and you're allowing that sort of behavior to go unaddressed, what does that say to new people coming in? It says that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody just recently got mad at me because there's certain things in our church you can't do and smoke cigarettes. Amen. Well, I don't believe smoking cigarettes is such a bad sin. I don't care whether it is or not. It's not good for your children. Amen. So you can't work with children and smoke cigarettes. Why? Because it would be just about six weeks before somebody will come home and tell Mama, I want to smoke. Why? Because Miss Charity does. <laughs> come on, you got kids? When the argument starts, they're going to pull out the heavy artillery. Tell you all the people that you've told them to submit to and obey. Come on. You, sometimes you've got to think things all the way through. It's not about you smoking. It's about the kids seeing you smoke or smelling you. It's even worse. Well, I always put on perfume. Trust me. I thought the same thing when I smoked too, but yeah. no. No, you smell like barbecue. <laughs> so anyway, Paul told him, let's look over there. First Corinthians. First Corinthians, the fifth chapter. This is the great excommunication passage. Verse 1, he said, It's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not, as is not even named among the Gentiles. 
<laughs> he said the pagans have got more sense than this. <laughs> that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed as absent in body but present in spirit have already judged as though I were present. Him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, several things you can notice here. First of all, I, I use this passage a lot of times to teach on prayer. And what do you mean? I said, These people had to have a prayer meeting to let the devil attack this guy. Most of our prayer meetings are for just the opposite. We're trying to get the devil off of people who we think are living right. They had to give the devil permission to attack a guy that they knew was living in sin. Think about that for a minute. I believe that that says to me that we're living way below our privilege in terms of how we got each other covered spiritually with our prayers. Amen. I'm looking forward to the day when we have to have a special prayer meeting to get together to allow the devil to attack somebody in our church. Not that I'm encouraging you to let the devil attack people, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, have, has that ever struck you? That has bothered me from the first time I ever read it. Because we're all in the prayer meeting, you know, just groaning and moaning and shouting, trying to get the devil off of people. Even nice people, good people, wonderful people, getting beat half to death. We can't get the devil off of them. And this guy, they had to, had to give him permission to attack the guy. And he's living in incest, for heaven's sake. <laughs> I mean, you think you'd have free sway in that situation, but apparently not if we're living where we're supposed to be in grace. Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. Amen. But I also want you to notice the purpose here. That we're going to kick him out and we don't have anything else to do with him. He said, no, uh, we're going to turn him over to the Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The point is, uh, when I, when I, years ago when I first went to AA, you know, they'd say, well, you can go back out there, but, that, but the, uh, alcohol will drive you back. Well, it's kind of that way with the church, you know. You can get mad and stomp off if you want to, but the devil will be sure to make you wish you'd come back. Yeah. Amen. The devil ain't changed. It hasn't gotten any better out there. And if we're living the way we should be here as far as keeping each other covered in prayer, then there would be a certain advantage to being in fellowship. Amen. 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 In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's look at there. I don't know why I couldn't get this off my heart today, so maybe this is for somebody. If you really want to know everything there is to know about it, uh, there's, no, there isn't a book in the bookstore because the bookstore is closed. But when we get to the new church and the bookstore opens, there's a wonderful book called You're a Keeper that goes into significant depth on this subject. <laughs> Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul said, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. <laughs> well, that sounds similar to what he said over in 1 Corinthians, doesn't it? He doesn't go into the detail about how that worked, but apparently Paul decided it was his job to clean up some doctrinal and blasphemous issues with these two fellows. He didn't say, I... I uh, kicked them out because uh, we didn't want them coming to the church social anymore. He said, I, I kicked them out. Why? So they can learn something. Amen. Now look with me in Matthew 18. There is a connection here, by the way, to Luke 15. And that would be in verse <clears throat> 10. He says, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. 
But I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who's in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, remember that's right, that's a parallel passage to Luke 15, isn't it? Does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that's straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Verse 15, Moreover, on top of that, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to even to hear the church, let them be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And then the next three verses, nearly everybody in charismatic world knows because they like them when they're taken completely out of context and you preach things that have absolutely nothing to do with what he was talking about. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Anybody ever been to a binding and loosened prayer meeting? There's not a single prayer in the New Testament that says anything about binding or loosening anything. Not one. <laughs> what was he talking about here? He's talking about what kind of behavior are you going to allow in your church? He said, whatever you allow, we'll allow. Whatever you forbid, we'll forbid. We'll back you up. When you go to your brother and you have to punch him out and send him away, we got you back. Me and the Father. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. He's talking about getting together and praying and releasing people from fellowship in the church. And that's what he was talking about when he said, For where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of you. Go read 1 Corinthians 5 again. When I am with you with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I messed up some people's theology, I can tell. You need to read the whole chapter sometimes. Amen. He's talking about church discipline in this passage. Amen. So what are you saying? I, I'm saying this, that uh, people sometimes reach a place where their behavior is harmful to other folks or divisive to the church, harmful to the body, where some decisions have to be made about what we're going to bind and what we're going to lose, what we're going to allow and what we're going to forbid. That's what the words mean. Amen. And uh, when it does reach that, then it's our obligation to protect the innocent and to protect the church. And when that happens and people have to be gone, it's not because we don't ever want to see them again. It's because we want them to learn something. Amen. Now look in 1 Corinthians 11. We've got five minutes. And you know where he's talking about uh, the Lord's table here. 24, 25, 26. And in verse 27 he says, Therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we would not be condemned with the world. <clears throat> I said all of this to make this point. And when people ask you questions like, why did this happen to so-and-so? Number one, sometimes you just flat don't know. But just recognize that if they belong to the Lord, He's working on them. Amen. Always. Never stops. How many, how many of you could truthfully say that even in your bad days, He keeps working on you? Yes. Yes. Amen. Well, He loves them other people just as much as He does you, whether they were a sheep that wandered off, a coin that got lost, or the prodigal that just kicked his mud in his daddy's face and went on down the road. He didn't quit working on any of them. And God never gives up on them. 
When you sing that song, His love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. That's a wonderful thing to do. But He said, Who the Lord loveth, He chastens. <laughs> Amen. Uh, how many of you ever heard that old phrase? Uh, God loves you just the way you are. And then the rest of the poster says, But He loves you too much to leave you that way. <laughs> Amen. That, that's the absolute truth. Here in this passage, He tells us clearly, he said, for this reason, some are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What's the reason? Some people have situations in their life that they have doggedly refused to deal with, even after the Lord. Uh, over in Job, he says, sometimes he comes to you in the night in a, in a vision. Sometimes he'll send people to your house to come talk to you. He said it happens one, two, three, four times. You'll be all the way to the point of death, and you repent and get better, and then you go through the whole thing again. Amen. And that's before anybody else even gets involved. In the New Testament, we have grace involved in it. What is grace? That means in the middle of all that, he will have somebody, if, if we're in a situation where we're harming other people, he will allow someone to come and warn us. One time, two times, three times. His grace is amazing. But at some point in time, amen, if people don't judge themselves, I love this verse in verse 31. He said, if we judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. Think about that for a minute. How much does God think of you? He's not even going to mess with you. He's going to give you the opportunity. Just correct yourself. You know right from wrong. You know what you're doing is wrong. You're a born-again child of God. You're created in the image of Almighty God. You know what's right. So just straighten yourself up. I won't even fool with you. He said, he said but when we are judged, I like the fact he didn't say if. When? What does that mean? All, all of us, one time or the other, just decide, yeah, I, don't, I know it's not right, but I'm just going to do it. Okay. He said, then when we are judged, <laughs> he says, we're chastened by the Lord. Talking about the church. When we're judged, we're chastened by the Lord so that we won't be what? Condemned with the world. What, what's the, what, uh, there, there's two Greek words in there. Judged is the Greek word krino. It means to discern or make a difference. In, in the courtroom, it would be found guilty. When we are found guilty, <laughs> when the verdict comes in, and sure enough, we're guilty, then we are chastened. The word chastened is, is corrected. It's translated nurture over in Ephesians chapter 4. It's kind of interesting. Chapter 5, pardon me. And the uh, Amen. So it's not talking about beating. It's talking about teaching. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, he tells us that the Father of spirits corrects us in the spirit. He uses his word and his spirit to correct us on the inside. Then when we are found guilty, we, us, those of us in the body of Christ, are chastened, corrected, nurtured, and instructed by the Lord for the purpose of avoiding the condemnation that's coming on the world. The word condemnation there is katakrino. It means on top of being found guilty. It means to be sentenced for your crimes. Amen. When we are found guilty, God corrects us. Why? So that we won't be sentenced with the world. What's the sentence that the world's going to enjoy? Yeah, eternal separation. So God's goal in correcting us is always what? Restoration and reconciliation keep our hearts soft and clean before Him so that we won't eventually harden up and walk off. Are you listening to me? Now, when you're in that process, when you said no to the tug of His Spirit, when you said no to corrections from friends, when you said no to the correction of the Spirit and the Word, sometimes over a period of months and even years, and then because you're living in the world and because you've sowed horrible seed, then catastrophe comes. Difficulty arises. Amen. And six months, eight months, you can't seem to get the victory. And people are coming and asking me, what's the matter with so-and-so? What's the matter with so-and-so? You know? They were a word person. They were a faith person. All this is happening. Isn't that awful? Here's the deal. When your heart condemns you, 
you can't stand before God in faith and believe God. Say, so, well, God made him sick. No, God didn't make him sick. God's trying to correct him. Well, he sent sickness. No, he didn't. Sickness just comes. The question is, what kind of shape are you in when it gets there? If you're in a position where your heart's telling you, you're wrong. You know you're wrong. I've been trying to tell you for four years that you're wrong. Are you listening to me? The person can't exercise their faith to receive. It has nothing to do with God's will. God's will is what? Restoration and reconciliation. He's been working at it now for years. Amen. Now, does that mean everybody that gets sick has some kind of horrible sin in their life? No. But it means that sometimes you've got no idea what's going on. It also means that when he says, warn the unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, and uphold the weak among us, that that is an incredibly important part of God's plan for restoration and reconciliation before the, pl the place comes where the assault of the enemy comes. Amen. And people are not in a position to receive the blessing. Are you listening to me? Amen. And what are you saying? I'm saying here in Matthew chapter 18, he talked about the sheep wandering away and then talked about this process. Why? Because this is just another way that God loves us so much that he will go out of his way and extend himself to restore us and reconcile, reconcile us because he is not willing that even one of these little ones will perish. He loves us too much to leave us that way. Amen. Stand up. Well, did y'all get anything out of that? That was a lot of material in a short time. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We just worship you and praise you. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you and praise you. Oh, we magnify your name. Magnify your name. Oh, Jesus. Just bow your heads for just a moment. Just worship. Talk to him. There's some place in your life where you're out of step. Time to take a little skip and get back in. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. If you know a brother or sister that's been overcome and overwhelmed by their own failures and their own weaknesses, this would be a good time to pray for them and begin the process of setting that broken bone and bringing a process of restoration to their life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Kubrick de le bestefe. Thank you, Lord. I feel like we ought to just stay quiet before him for a minute. Let him talk to people. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's lift our hands and sing that chorus. How great is our God. 
How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Sing it again. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. That all will see how great, how great is our God. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for these precious people. Thank you, Father God, for your love for us so much that you just absolutely refuse to see us walk away unimpeded. But you correct us. You correct us. You nurture us. You teach us. I thank you for that. Father God, this night I pray for each of these, that those relationships in their lives that need to be restored, renewed, and reset. Father, you give them grace to show them how to get that done. Not a single broken bone. In Jesus' name. Amen.